uh, because generally when we think about caretakers, these are not the individuals that we uh, sort of label as needing to cultivate compassion. Um, and I, I would imagine that uh, all of you here in some capacity are caretakers, whether it be professionally or even privately, personally in your own lives. But whatever way that plays out for you, um, it is something that I think we all have an intuitive sense about when we hear this idea of compassion uh, and cultivating it, that it is a resource that is waning. Um, and I'm actually very uh, fond and appreciative of the, uh, the theme for this year's conference, uh, this idea of thirsting, right? Because I think all of us deal with, with yearning in some capacity, um, and we're looking for resources. We're looking for the source. Uh, so when it relates to this idea of compassion, uh, I think we all have an intuitive sense that this is something that I could always use more of, even if I am a loving person, even if I am a person that gives of myself. Uh, and so I think this is uh, an important conversation to have, and hopefully it could be a meaningful one for you. I uh, want to just take a moment to kind of uh, share with you what, what brings me here, why this subject matter is important to me. Uh, on the screen are pictures of my, my family, uh, my wife and three kids. Uh, we live in Southern California together. And uh, just two things I want to highlight here for you. Um, you know, germane to this conversation is, uh, I'm, I'm here uh, representing uh, SAC Health as a chaplain. Uh, so in that capacity, uh, I am serving as a caretaker uh, because I, I have to be uh, present in those moments when I'm having those very deep, meaningful, sometimes transformative conversations. Um, I can't just show up with just surface. I have to be open to be able to connect with that person. Um, but the other part that makes this subject matter so meaningful to me is that you'll see on the bottom corner there, my little son, Ian. Uh, and perhaps you've observed that he's actually sitting on a hospital bed, uh, which uh, speaks to, he's uh, just a little bit over, well, he's about to be four in, in October. And in his short little life, he's had uh, probably more hospitalizations than I care to count uh, because he has an autoimmune disorder. Um, so what that creates is a dynamic where both my wife and I serve as caretakers for him, uh, also for his siblings. But when you have a child with a chronic illness, it creates a lot of unique situations. And so you're always in this space of having to sort of assess, well, how much compassion do I have here, All right? Now, this is my son, so I love him and I wanna give him everything that I can, but in truth, I'm, I'm always assessing and weighing because I have to divide that, right, in a way that can serve all the needs of the people that I'm in, I'm in community with and have enough for when I go to work. So you can see the dynamic that creates for us. And that's why this, this subject matter is so important to me. So I think it's important for us, um, before we kind of jump into this conversation in earnest, to really kind of identify and clarify what the nomenclature is. Uh, because when you hear the word compassion, I think probably there's, <laughs> for however many people there are in this room right now, there are probably twice as much definitions of what compassion could mean. Um, and all of them I think are applicable, but uh, for the sake of discussion, I wanna just be able to pinpoint what I mean by, by compassion when we're talking about it. And what you see here is a definition that I think works well for us. And I've kind of teased out from that definition a sort of, uh, I guess, formula, if you will, of how compassion works. Uh, so the concern that unfolds when we witness the suffering of others and feel motivated to relieve it. So you could see that two-part play in there. Uh, empathy plus action is what we get when we're talking about compassion. Um, conventionally, the, the idea that people tend to connect compassion with is empathy. They kind of see them sometimes as synonymous, but it's actually quite different. Um, empathy is, is talking about the sort of uh, evocation of emotion, right? It's, it's what you feel. It's, it's, it's what just comes out of you when you, when you witness something. It's, it's impulsive, it's natural. Um, but the action part is, is not necessarily something that comes intuitively. Uh, and you need that part there to actually call it and for it to sort of embody this idea of compassion, okay? To be compassionate individuals, however, um, it's important for us to acknowledge what allows us to do this in the most natural context. 
this, this chart right here uh, comes out of a study uh, that endeavored to kind of understand in our human experience what helps us to be uh, so the, the most successful or the most uh, responsive, the most humane. Um, and what they found in the study is that generally as human beings, um, we kind of have a lot of stimuli coming at us at any given point in time usually unannounced and most of the time inconvenient, right? Um, but as long as we can stay in what's called the resiliency zone, uh, we have a general ability to be responsive to those kind of stimuli. And, and honestly, um, in terms of resiliency zones, um, I'm usually forcing myself to kind of stay in it because life kind of has a way of pushing you out, right? And you'll see that in the next slide. But these are sort of the elements that, that sort of play into that, the sympathetic system, the parasympathetic system, they all work to kind of keep you in that resiliency zone. And when you remain in that capacity, you have the ability to operate with, as, you know, with a high level of efficiency. Your pro-social engagement, your ability to make executive uh, decisions, um, and also your ability to, to be responsive to situations that you see around you. And it's, it's important to note that responsive as opposed to reactive is an important distinction here. Because to be compassionate individuals, it cannot be a reactive response. It has to be, to some extent, premeditated. A sense of these values that I stand up for are needing to be defended here, and I'm going to go and do that. OK? I wish I had a little clicker. So um, this is what it looks like, right, <laughs> when we pop out of that resiliency zone. Uh, life happens, right, a trigger or stressful event, and you have sort of these two extremes, right? It's either hyperarousal or hypoarousal, and it comes with the sort of adjacent, um, you know, conditions and, and challenges that we struggle with as a society. And I'm sure if you look at that, you'll probably see something that you could relate to personally or someone you know could relate to, okay? These are the realities of our lives. And, and so when we are in these sort of extreme situations, it creates for us a bit of a kind of a calculating uh, effect of, well, if I'm out of my resiliency zone and then I'm exposed to something that I want to be able to react to, I want to be able to act on, what resources do I have available to myself to do that? These are real conversations that we have intuitively. This is just a little chart to show you all of the ways that that impacts us. So we live in a society where we're constantly bombarded by information. Anybody can relate? All right? Um, <laughs> I remember uh, when I was going through a stressful time um, and I was not able to attend to my personal inbox on my phone. Um, and I, I didn't even know it was able to do this. Don't ask me why I, I didn't think that, but the little icon where the male, uh, you know, sort of icon was, had reached above $10,000, uh, $10,000, 10,000 emails, 10,000 emails. And I'm thinking to myself, there's no way I can like actually bring this inbox down to zero. But I had this insatiable urge to do it anyway, right? <laughs> And so I'm sitting there wherever I get a few moments to just kind of like, okay, well, delete this. All right, no, I don't need that. Oh, I need to respond to this. And of course, I never got anything close to zero, but that urge was still there. And that's the kind of stuff that's coming at us constantly, stimuli that's asking us to respond, asking us to interact, asking us to give a response, asking us to give input. Among other things that are coming at us, right? I, you see false projections there. You see overrated dangers. The way we're processing the information can sometimes put us in this hyper-aroused or hypo-aroused state and lead to, right, an actual cost. It is not a zero-sum game. These things translate to what generally is called inflammation and ultimately leads to some of the disease challenges that you see at the bottom of the screen. Now, this is a bit more anecdotal, but I think it's still worth mentioning, and maybe some of you know the actual specifics here, but I think I've heard somewhere around 90% 90% of modern diseases are correlated to stress. That's an inordinate amount of, right? That's a huge amount, 90%. And so when we think about all of these sort of ways that we've learned to live, um, we have to contemplate what the true cost is of 
our inability to be able to modulate and deal with, with stress and how that actually impacts us as, as a society. And I think that's when we start really contemplating the cost of compassion, okay? Because I think there's a shadow economy of compassion that we probably all sort of process and deliberate about every time we're exposed to something where we have to act, right? And all of you in some capacity are in a place in your community where there's something that you could act on, but you're, you're actually sitting back and you're processing, well, I have to do this, I have to be present for this person, right? And it's, it's there, it's happening. It's happening simultaneously in, in real time, and you're having to sort of weigh that out. And a lot of times, we've been trained to resist this idea of extending ourselves. And here's where it gets really interesting. Because conventional wisdom says that if I am at a deficit, and there's something for me to act on, my inclination is to be conservative. And even though I want to help, because I'm a good person, I'm decent, I was raised well. Well, I'll just give you my pinky. I'll just give you my pinky because at least I'm doing something, but I can't give you the whole thing, right? And that's the conventional wisdom, that if we somehow are in this state of deficit and we practice conservativeness in that respect, that we'll somehow be able to meet other challenges that are yet to come. I want to challenge that logic. And in fact, in fact, the research is actually showing us that that's uh, not the case, that it's actually the inverse. That this idea of compassion, even though it is related to concepts of burnout, and I know that the, the term compassion fatigue has been thrown around uh, here quite a bit. I, I think I even had that in the blurb for this presentation. Um, but you might find, after we explore this a little bit, that um, the idea of compassion fatigue is a bit of a misnomer, right? Because compassion is the combination of empathy plus action. So in reality, when we're talking about compassion fatigue, what we're probably really talking about is, is empathy fatigue. Because that's really what's needed in that moment for us to act out and be able to respond to some of the challenges that we face in our communities and in the world at large. But when we are able to understand that our capacity for compassion is rooted in our ability to cultivate deep empathy, not only for ourselves, but for our society, there is a natural unction to be compassionate. There's a natural capacity to be responsive to our, to our problems and our challenges in society, but we have to cultivate that sense of empathy. And I think what's profound about, oh, don't know why that's there. Okay, we'll just leave that alone. What's profound about the research is that um, they've actually done brain scans using functional MRIs. Um, and uh, in these brain scans, I think the way it works, you know, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not going to pretend to be, is that it sort of uh, looks at the sort of the cerebral blood flow. And so wherever the blood is flowing in the brain, that's kind of where activity is happening. Sort of a crude, uh, you know, um, description of what they're doing there. But in these brain scans, they're able to see that when we are exposed to images of, of people suffering, that our pain centers in our brain actually wake up, actually light up, right? Now, that may not be surprising to you, um, but it actually, I think, is a, a powerful statement because it shows that when we say, you know, wow, that hurts watching, or, you know, I feel your pain, that's actually physiologically supported. Right? So we have a deep and, and, and physiological capacity for seeing suffering and wanting to do something about it. Here's where it gets really interesting. The same study uh, showed that in the brain scans that when that situation is responded to, meaning when there's an action on it to resolve it, that the reward centers of your brain light up. So it seems as if there's a construct built in us uh, that when we see others suffering and we're able to respond to it, that there's this natural sense of re response that is healing. So in some ways you can say empathy is pain, but compassion is healing. Compassion is the, is the opportunity for us to resolve the pain that we feel when we see somebody else suffering. 
which I think connects to uh, the implication I made just a moment ago that when we say compassion fatigue, what we probably really mean is empathy fatigue because what really happens is that when we are constantly bombarded by images in situations that we cannot respond to, it creates a dynamic within us that essentially drains us, right? One of the biggest challenges, I think you might agree, of uh, the pandemic that we all just went through is that we were constantly exposed to situations where we were bearing witness to people's suffering and we felt helpless. We felt helpless. I remember growing up as a kid watching uh, some of these commercials of uh, distressed children in, 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 in very impoverished situations. And obviously I was a kid, so I couldn't really respond to the call to action that was being made in those commercials, which is, can you give us some money? But I remember feeling so helpless seeing that, right? Because all I could do is just watch it in that moment. And I can't really do anything to interact with that person to change the outcome. And what it created in me, I think, was intuitive, even if a little bit crass, I think, the way I might see it for myself, which is that whenever those commercials came on, I changed the channel. Not because I wasn't empathic, not because I didn't feel the pain, but in fact, because I felt the pain and I could not do anything about it. So this concept uh, evolved from uh, a uh, Center for Contemplative Science and Compassion-Based Ethics at Emory University. Uh, this is actually where I had the unique privilege of being able to do my uh, pastoral education. Um, and uh, it's called Cognitively Based Compassion Training, CBCT, which is uh, the mechanism that they created as a way of responding to this sort of idea of empathy lacking. How do we cultivate empathy so that it becomes a natural response to act out when we are in situations uh, where, where we need um, to respond? And so I'll just read the definition for you just to get a sense of what we're talking about here. CBCT emerged from an Indo-Tibetan Buddhist tradition called Lojong, meaning mind training. Um, combined with insights drawn from psychology, neurobiology of emotions and social sciences, the framework was intentionally secularized to be useful for individuals of any or no faith tradition. Okay, and that's an important point to make. Obviously, um, you know, the, the idea of um, sort of, uh, if you will, ecumen ecumenism is not something that I think everybody's comfortable with. Um, we honor a lot of different faith traditions, but to be able to just take the concepts within Lojong, secular, secularize them so that we can engage with them as uh, Christians or people of any faith tradition or no faith tradition, I think is a meaningful one. And I'll uh, share that from a Christian context, why that could be meaningful for us, okay? Uh, the general primary tool that's used here is meditation, and I'll share a slide here in the next um, page uh, that shows you the, the benefits of meditation. But that's the primary tool. Uh, CBCT cultivates cognitive habits through six contemplative modules meant to train the mind with the skills and perspectives that generate compassion. Um, this study was done, um, and actually this is a recent study, but uh, the idea of this study was to basically see between meditation and what they call ATB, which is attention to breath, right, which is actually part of one of the modules, um, which was effective as it relates to lowering people's anxiety levels. And what we were able to see, right, through these MRI scans, right here, this is just attention to breath. How impactful was attention to breath um, after 20 minutes of exposure to, um, to meditation? Well, actually, this is just attention to breath, so you could see uh, that uh, pre-session and post-session that there wasn't any real decrease, right, uh, in, in anxiety. But in all the instances where meditation was included, or it was just meditation, or meditation and attention to breath, you could see a significant decrease of anxiety. Um, and so meditation, um, in the sense of how we can use it to address some um, of our stress and, and the ways that we cope with uh, different things that happen to us in, in life, is an effective tool, as uh, this study has been able to illustrate. I wanted to also share with you, again, from a Christian context, um, this idea of mind training, right? Does it have a place here for us? Um, obviously, within our faith, 
Um, there are plenty of texts that I could probably reach out to, but these three, I think, speak powerfully to uh, what it is that we're endeavoring to do here as, as uh, people of faith. Um, these are actually three of, of my favorite texts. All of them are, are from Paul, um, and I think they speak powerfully to this. Uh, Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Romans 12, 2, uh, one of my favorites. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? By the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 1 Timothy 4, verse 7 and 8. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. And what would you fit into that, that if you were to sort of parenthesize that silly myths? What would you fit into that? What qualifies as silly myths in, in your context, right? Rather, train yourself for godliness. And if you look at the text here, Paul is sort of juxtaposing um, spending time consuming in silly myths versus training yourself in godliness. He's talking about the mind. He's talking about the mind. How do we train ourselves in godliness? And then here's the, here's the distinction he's making. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This is the promise that's in Scripture. So I think that um, there is an invitation to do intentional mind training and, and to sort of cultivate sort of a, a, a scaffolding that we can uh, lean on and, and use in moments of high stress and anxiety so that we can um, meet the challenges of, of our world. So this is the sort of 30,000 foot view of, of all the modules, how they work with each other. Um, I'm gonna take some, some time for probably the rest of our time here uh, to um, kind of go over these briefly to give you a sense of what each of them endeavors to do uh, as a mind training exercise. I do want to say, though, too, that this is just one option. Um, if you do enough uh, sort of, you know, even a cursory research on Google, you'll find that there are other institutes that are providing other mechanisms. It's the same general principle, which is that by engaging through meditative exercises, mental medita meditative exercises, that we could actually cultivate that, you know, scaffolding in our minds that create the capacity to, resp to be responsive as compassionate individuals, okay? Um, so that's just sort of a, a general view of how each of them work together, but let's go into uh, greater detail to kind of understand um, what each one is presenting. The first module um, is this idea of connecting to a moment of nurturance. <clears throat> Actually, from what I understand, um, from one of the founding members of this, of this principle, uh, initially this module was not a part of the, of the construct, it was created afterwards because what they realized was that when people engage with the modules, they were not able to really kind of sink into the modules so that they can engage with the exercises intentionally. And part of the reason was because people did not feel a sense of safety and security as they were engaging it. So this first one, really, that's what it's about. It's about putting your mind in a state of safety. Um, anybody ever kind of just is walking around and then all of a sudden you feel a sense of danger, right? I mean, it happens that for any given situation, it could be a threat that you're perceiving somewhere. Maybe that threat is real. Maybe it's imagined. But it happens. We have an intuitive sense of picking up from our surroundings what we might see as dangerous or unsafe. Uh, the ability to sort of reorient uh, yourself to safety is a skill set that if you can manage, um, it can be extremely useful for you in very difficult situations. For example, like speaking to a, bu a bunch of strangers at a conference. Right? Right? I mean, and, and you might think, okay, I'm doing this with some relative ease, but even as someone who's experienced uh, speaking publicly in front of people, I have to deal with some anxiety. Right? So this module is actually very useful for me that when I'm in instances where I feel sort of my anxiety bubbling up for one reason or the other, I just close my eyes and I go to that moment of nurturance. And what I mean by moment of nurturance is that any memory that cultivates for you a sense of safety that cultivates for you a sense of warmth. Um, and, and nurturance, not only in terms of what you're receiving, but what you were giving. The memory I like to go to is when my children are born. Because I remember every time that 
I was able to sort of hold them after they were cleaned up and everything. Here's this little bundle of joy that, whose life is completely in my hands. Um, and that sense of vulnerability that they had opened me up to vulnerability. So it gave me a sense of safety to know that this mutual vulnerability was, was just right there for me uh, to access. Um, of course, now they're toddlers and they drive me crazy, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> You'd be surprised um, how difficult it is to focus on one thing. When we first did this exercise in my training, um, it was really interesting because the idea here is to focus on the breath, the sensations of the breath. And I'm telling you, even if we were to do it right now, if we had the time to do it, I definitely would invite you to do it. And you'd find that as soon as you start focusing on your breath, what happens? Well, you do relax, but what happens? Huh? Well, that would, be, that would be the goal. That would be, you said you just think about breathing. That would be the goal. But what actually happens, if we're being honest, is what? Our mind just wanders away and starts thinking about something else, right? That ability, that skill set to be able to focus on, on one thing is actually what's, what the goal is here. Because, because we, we don't realize it, but that when we are sort of engaged in life, thoughts kind of come in and bombard us. And we could be doing something that's very important that requires our attention and our stability in that space. But those thoughts come and invade and they completely disrupt what we're doing. Or they share something that's not only undermining what we're doing, it actually creates a sense of insecurity and so we're not able to do it effectively and be fully present to the moment. So being able to exercise that, that sort of breath training and paying attention to, to the inhalation and the exhalation is a very, very difficult skill to cultivate, but it's one that can be immensely rewarding if you endeavor to do it. Uh, I, I find that, and this was sort of, it was good to have somebody there kind of consulting me as we were training this, because it, when, when your thoughts do what it will inevitably do, which is kind of think about, oh, I got to do this, and oh man, what happened to sister so-and-so and whatever, it just goes, it just goes. What our facilitator said is that just gently, just bring it back and focus back on the breathing, focus back on the breathing. And it's gonna go again, just gently pull it back, right? Over time, what you start to see is that you're able to hold it longer, right? Now the goal here is not to just kind of keep that focus in perpetuity because quite frankly, it's probably impossible. <laughs> We're just humans. But the longer you can keep it in that capacity, you're actually training the capacity to focus on one task and be able to, to not allow distractions to disrupt your capacity to do that. Are we tracking so far? Okay. So this is actually a two-part module. Um, the idea of cultivating self-compassion, accepting our vulnerabilities. When we are able to contemplate that we are limited, that we do not show up a finished product, uh, one of my favorite terms that we used during my training in pastoral, uh, pastoral care was growing edges. Have anybody ever heard of that? Right? <laughs> it's, this, it's this idea that says that, look, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like, if you think of me as a terrain, I have edges that are still kind of rough and rocky, and, you know, I probably wouldn't go there if I were you. <laughs> and we all have growing edges, and that's okay. That's okay. Right? We have a society construct that tells us we have to show up complete. We have to show up perfect. We have to show up unblemished. It is not true. It is not true. Our ability to contemplate our own vulnerabilities begins to create the space for us to accept the vulnerabilities of others. And the extent to which we can do that um, really has a profound impact on our ability to be in spaces where we might feel insecure and not have to project something that is untrue, okay? Um, we have setbacks, right? We have limitations. And, and when we, I, I like this bottom um, part in terms of the enduring capabilities that come out of this uh, module. When we apply a systems thinking perspective to setbacks, understanding that there are many contributing factors to any outcome not within all our control, 
How many times when something goes wrong, what happens? We start. When in reality, who was it? Who was it that said this? Like, ah, this just came to me. I, I did, this wasn't part of my notes, but um, uh, it's, I think the, the, the world that you have is the world that you created. The world that you have is the world that you created. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, me? I created this world? The world that we have is the world that we created. It's not an accident. There were intentional choices that led to these worlds and also intentional realities and limitations. Accepting that is the beginning of being able to shift our paradigm. How am I doing on time? Okay. So this is the second part of, of, uh, of that module. Um, how do we find meaning in our vulnerabilities? Uh, what's the purpose of them? Um, one of my favorite things um, in uh, sort of, I guess, the business space um, or any kind of organizational context is uh, what they call a SWOT analysis, right? You all acquainted with that one? Um, and what I like about the SWOT analysis, obviously we have strengths, we have weaknesses, but man, can we talk about opportunities, right? And how can we truly understand our opportunities if we don't take a full assessment of our strengths and our weaknesses? So this, this uh, um, module uh, endeavors to say, okay, well, now that I have a sense of my limitations and my vulnerabilities, what invitations, what opportunities are coming out of that that I can take advantage of right now to create outcomes that I perhaps couldn't see before, right? Because our vulnerabilities are actually opportunities for connection. They're opportunities for bridging with others within their strengths and building on that in a way that can be collaborative and helpful to whatever the goal is. Um, so having that sensitivity and compassion for others, um, being able to understand that I can take control of my situation, I don't have to be sort of a, a victim to my own limitations. All these are powerful, I think, enduring capabilities that come out of this module. Anybody has a bias here? Does anybody have a working mind? <laughs> then you have a bias. Um, biases are not bad, but they can be weaponized. They can be weaponized. Um, I don't think anything has taught us more about our common humanity uh, than what we experienced a few years ago in the pandem pandemic, right? I mean, for all intents and purposes, uh, not to be uh, you know, political or anything like that, but something that's purported to come out of a, a city in, in China, as I understand it, within seconds, within seconds, it seems, spread through the world like a brush fire. And all of us were exposed, all of us. I remember when I heard the first report that it was somewhere in, uh, in Washington State, somewhere in the Seattle area. And I was thinking, uh, yeah, you know, just like that. Our world changed completely. And for all of the ways that our society is fractured or that we set and develop separations, categories of how you're this and I'm that. In that instance, all of us were human on one globe, and there was no Mars to go to. Our common humanity tends to show up in points of crisis, and they tell us salient things about ourselves that we tend to forget when the crisis is gone but it is vitally important for us to reset and learn from those crises because they give us the key to understanding how we can better our humanity going forward. What are the things that we did in the pandemic that we're not doing now that perhaps maybe we should keep doing? And I'm not talking about wearing masks, <laughs> but I'm talking about perhaps maybe even the inclination as to why you wore a mask. 
or why you understood the importance of that, right? And this is connected, even though it's not like sort of part one and part two, it's still connected to the previous one. Um, this module uh, seeks to cultivate a sense of our interdependence on each other. I remember watching this, uh, you know how they have the, they have the um, um, children's programs and, and sometimes they show, I think whether on Sesame Street or something like that, they'll show the, uh, the way that, okay, this is how uh, food gets to the grocery store, right? And so you start watching the process and, uh, it goes from the factory or from, no, from the farm uh, to the factory, I guess, and from the factory goes to the, uh, you know, to the 18 wheeler and that takes it to the, you know, so on and so forth. So I'm watching this with my kids and, you know, I didn't think anything of it. Fast forward to a few days later, I'm uh, rushing to the store to get something that I desperately need. Um, it happened to be the uh, Oatly um, oat milk, uh, which is very popular these days. Um, so I went to the store <laughs> And lo and behold, uh, they were out. And I was very upset because I need my Oatly, right? Um, and I was like, okay, yeah, whatever. So I got, I think, another version. I think, I think it was Chobani or something like that. And, um, and went home. Fast forward to a few days later, I'm in traffic. I'm in traffic. And I got to get to where I'm going. Um, and if you know anything about Southern California, uh, on a Friday... <laughs> <laughs> on a Friday uh, evening, uh, there were probably like 10,000 um, 18 wheelers right there on a stretch of road, right? And everybody's just jockeying to get to where they're going. And I try to make a move with my little car, and this 18 wheeler, uh, you know, they can be a bit bullying sometimes, you know, I'm just gonna say that. So, yeah. Did this really aggressive move that really could have probably damaged me in my car. And I was so upset. I'm like, come on, man, you know. Only a few days later, did the thought came to me how those events were connected. Meaning the two last events that I shared with you. Because here I am at the store upset that my Oatly was not where I wanted it to be when I needed it. But then I'm on the road upset with this truck driver because, well, he's just trying to get to his destination, which is probably to deliver some Oatly to the supermarket. <laughs> right? <laughs> And so here's our, here's our reality as humans, that we live in this sort of interdependent context where we don't see how what we do affects the other and how we are reliant on each other, right? And it creates these sort of very short and demanding kind of interactions, these transactions, where it's like, okay, just give me my milk or just give me this, without realizing that there is really a deep interdependence that we rely on for society to work, for it to function. And so this is what this module endeavors to to uh, illustrate, an other-oriented context instead of a self-focused context. Um, harnessing the power of compassion um, is, is essentially the goal, the ultimate goal um, of all of these modules, and, and sort of this is the culminating act um, because it, it helps us to, to see that uh, when we are able to see the vulnerability of others, when we're able to see how we're interconnected with each other, that we have an ability to respond automatically to situations where there are shortcomings. You have an innate ability given to you by God to fix what's wrong, but you cannot generate the capacity, the capacity to have, uh, strike that in my mind, you cannot generate the ability to have broken hearts. I, let, me, let me put it this way. I remember speaking to sort of an elder uh, of mine um, and thinking that um, a situation that was uh, really heartbreaking um, where I acted out to fix and I actually fumbled it because my actions did not fix but only made the situation worse. Um, and I was a little bit frustrated, so I came to this elder to get some advice and context. And <clears throat> he shared something that I think resonates with me um, very powerfully, which is that even our capacity uh, to be loving and kind to our fellow brothers and sisters is a gift from God. It's a gift. 
it, it, it might be a bit virtuous for us to think that, oh, look, you know, I'm, I'm a sentient being and I see this and it's hurtful and I want to respond. But as the understanding comes to us that this is a gift, I think it gives us the ability to nurture it a little bit more, uh, to handle it with a little bit more care, so that when we see instances where others are vulnerable and that we want to respond, it is not so much this sort of natural human inclination, but more so a collaboration with the divine, right? That God is inviting you to be his hands and his feet in this specific situation. And how we're able to do that really comes back to our ability to make ourselves proper receptacles of God's love. So that's just another kind of overview of, of the whole thing, how it works together. I'll, I'll give you a chance to take a look at that or if you want to take any screenshots. Um, but um, I'll just point out one thing here, which is that the goal here is, is here. Right? Because that's what we all want. And that's what the people suffering want. The people who are relying on you to intervene and help them to overcome a difficult situation. We're all just wanting well-being. Um, so if it's not giving you that, then it's not useful. It's not useful. I wanted to share with you um, Probably some more, you know, kind of uh, heady stuff, but I think it's still important to, to share maybe some of the impacts of this in terms of the research. Uh, CBCT is actually one of the most researched uh, modules, um, and that could be in part because it, it uh, emanated from Emory, which is a very large uh, research institution, but um, it, it, it does have a lot of research backing it, um, and these are just some of the ways that it's impacted um, in the research. This is obviously more kind of uh, a cursory list, but um, I think it's still one that's worth looking at. Um, depression, loneliness, PTSD, um, self-compassion, hopefulness. These are places where it decreases and increases. So here, right, right here are just the two studies um, that I wanted to kind of uh, elaborate on with you. Uh, the effect of compassion meditation on neuroendocrine and innate immune and behavioral responses to psychosocial stress. And so early studies are suggesting that CBCT would positively influence key blood-based bi uh, blood biomarkers of stress and inflammation. Um, obviously, there's still future studies that need to be done to, to sort of validate some of these findings, but um, it looks very promising. Um, this one, I think, is really profound because it says something about us that I think we need to uh, acknowledge. Compassion med meditation enhances empathic accuracy and related neuroactivity. I actually participated with this study while I was still at Emory. And basically what they were doing was showing after we did the CBCT, how much more able were we to discern, like they would show us image of people's affects and, and different sort of stages, how much more able were we able, how much more were we able to discern <laughs> uh, whatever the emotion we were seeing, right? And so there's actually, the study was able to show uh, that CBCT uh, may improve the ability to interpret facial expressions along with increasing activity in parts of the brain associated with empathic reason. So basically, in layman's terms, CBCT seems to be helpful to help you to be more attentive and attuned to what's going on around you. So the general scope of the research um, is, is pretty broad. You can see at the bottom there uh, that it's uh, um, kind of, there's research that's uh, ongoing uh, with uh, parents of children with aut autism, depressed patients and their partners, NICU nurses, right? That's a cohort that ex is extremely uh, prone to burnout uh, and many more. So, and, and the collaborations also are pretty myriad. So psychiatrists, neuroscientists, public health professionals and others. Um, so this is just the three um, sort of research articles that I cited. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at these if, if uh, you want to kind of do more insight. And then I'll share a resource here at the, a um, couple resources here in the next page, but uh, I want to give you a chance to take some pictures of that. Um, I think evidence base is, is very important, um, even when you're kind of presenting these, well, probably especially when you're presenting these kind of situations, because it can't just be purely anecdotal, right? Um, there has to be a sense of, okay, is this effective? And uh, how do we know it's actually useful? Um, 
So I wanted to share with you a few resources, and, and this gets to your question. Um, right here is a, a link to what's called the compassion shift. Um, so in terms of the frequency that you use CBCT, um, this could be more on an individual basis, right? Uh, and in terms of uh, how you use it for your teams and, and your organizations, that's going to take a little bit more kind of, uh, you know, thought and calculation in terms of how you want to execute that. Um, you could do it in a, in a group setting um, and facilitate that perhaps at a, you know, a huddle or something like that. Um, but I find that it's better to integrate it into um, the personal life, right? Because it's, it's really about how do you attune yourself to the world, not so much how do you attune yourself for the organization you work for. Is, is that clear? Are, are we tracking? I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, no, maybe? Clear as mud? No. Okay. <laughs> um, so these books right here um, are, well, this one was very helpful just in preparation for, for this presentation. Uh, written by the same individuals. Um, this, this second one, well, this one is written for healthcare systems. So I think you'll find a lot of uh, interesting uh, insights about how uh, compassion is useful, uh, not only in integrating into health systems culturally, but also the impact of it even from a cost standpoint. Uh, there's actual research that's showing that um, you know, uh, compassion integration into healthcare systems improves outcomes significantly um, and saves a, a great deal of money in terms of uh, you know, patient compliance. I think the, uh, don't quote me on this, but I think there's about 100 million um, uh, in cost savings uh, that can be had if we were to be more compassionate in the way that we integrated our care. Uh, and that relates to money loss from, um, you know, um, from appointments not being kept, from uh, medications not being taken, all these different kind of patient compliance issues that I'm sure you all deal with in some capacity. Um, so that's just a website uh, where you'll find a lot of material that I covered uh, in more detail uh, for the modules. And of course, like I said earlier, this is where you could actually practice uh, the, uh, the modules. So it's actually a guided meditation that you can use uh, uh, on that website and just helps you through that training process. So that's this website right here. Anybody seen this book before? Um, so it's by Brene Brown, wonderful book. Um, and I included it because it is, um, I use it a lot in my, in my uh, practice, if you will. Um, and it's just a great book because it, it, it helps to give language to some of the very difficult emotions that we carry. Um, Brene Brown is uh, a social researcher, I think in the University of Texas, somewhere like that. Um, but uh, she uh, has just a profound sense of being able to communicate and, and does research on this, communicate all our uh, sort of heart feelings. So the things that are, she teases out the things that are hard to describe in a way that can be more, um, more helpful to help uh, create connection. Can we pray together? Okay. God, we're so grateful for uh, this opportunity. Um, it's not lost on us that uh, this is not the panacea. Uh, we have not fixed the world's problems. Um, but if we can just make some incremental progress, um, we will be so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for everyone here and for the places that they serve, uh, just with so much that they give every day. And I know that while you invite us to do that and you encourage us to do that, you also incline us to do what you did, to steal away for a little bit and to reconnect with the things that really matter, to reconnect with you. And so my prayer is that Everyone here within the sound of my voice will, will find that point of connection with you and that it will invigorate them to continue to serve these God-sized problems and hopefully wait for God-sized solutions. Thank you for your grace in these spaces, we pray in your name. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you.